Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the AFRICAM show, brought to you by explore.org. My name is Russell Gerber, back again with you this week to enjoy the lovely live cameras. Let's see what we've got hanging around at the various waterholes around Africa. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Kicking off the show today, the beautiful Tau camera. We've got some blue wildebeest relaxing in the afternoon. A little kudu in the background, looks like some greater kudu in the background, and of course an elephant butt slowly walking away from us. But a big hello to all of you out there. Do feel free to send us a little hello message, and of course any questions you might have for us on the show this week. We've got some great little highlight clips lined up for you, which we'll get to in just a little while. But uh, do feel free to give us a shout out at any time during the show. As I said, I'll do my best to get to your questions during the show today. It looks like we had a few little audio gremlins at the beginning of the show, so I hope you're all hearing me okay now. So peaceful here at Tau. And as I mentioned, just so many different big mammal species that have been around the waterhole here. Seeing great numbers of elephants. Of course, a lovely time for us to view them on the cameras as all the animals are concentrated around the ever dwindling waterholes. And we're still a few more months away from the rainy season. But for now, things are pretty, pretty tough for all the herbivores. It's very much going to be the theme for them for the next few months. Good time for the predators, though. A lot of the animals are, well, their prey species are a little bit more weakened and lose a little bit of condition when there's not great food around. Of course, all these animals are so hardy, though, and they can survive these lean times. In many areas around southern Africa where we've got our cameras of course we've had a pretty good rainy season earlier in the year quite a lot of rain that fell fairly late in the season so it's managed to keep things holding on in a lot of the different locations and Dala Theobald says beautiful to see Indeed, Dalek, it's such a lovely sight here at Tau. Especially with all the wonderful animals around, as I mentioned. And KB asks, when do the rains return? I love seeing everything greening up. Absolutely, KB. We're still a little while away. Generally speaking, we'll start seeing our first rains around about uh, the end of October, perhaps in the beginning of November. Of course, nothing is getting thrown. But that tends to be where we start getting our first little tastes of the rain. And then as we head into December and January, in most of the areas that we have our cameras down here in South Africa, that's when we will begin to get our real rainy season. Alicia Coombs asks, what kind of deer are those? Those deer walking in the background are, in fact, antelope, not deer. 
Yeah, they're a little covered up, but they look to be greater kudu. Look like females. The male kudus have beautiful spiral shaped horns. And those lovely big ears on the kudu is often a good giveaway of what we're looking at. And they are browsers, they tend to feed on the leaves as you can see them doing now. And the other little antelope we saw walk through your picture a few minutes ago was a impala, the almost rusty brown color, also with the lovely horns. The males also have horns and the females do not. Yeah, one of the biggest antelope species we get here in southern Africa the kudu. And for them, as I mentioned, also a pretty tough time with big predators hanging around. As the animals are forced to hang around the waterhole, many of the predators take advantage of that. And so they'll spend a lot of time next to these waterholes Just checking them out and waiting for the their prey species to come on down. And in many ways, it is a time of plenty for them. And I think just to kick off the show's highlights today, might be a good time to look at some of those predators. And this was a lovely clip that we got from the area. And the cameras that we're looking at now, this was that tower itself. You can see a really interesting interaction between <laughs> some of Africa's most iconic predators. And here you can see these three male lions, very interested in these crocodiles hanging out outside of the water. And you can see they're very careful, knowing that they're on the wrong side of that crocodile. There are two formidable predators in their own right. I've actually seen myself it happening both ways where crocodiles have in fact killed lions, captured a lion and eaten them. And the other way around, I've seen lions jump onto the back of a crocodile outside of the water and actually eat the crocodile too. So they're equally well matched in many ways, but on land you'd certainly give the advantage to the lions in the water, of course very much to the crocodiles. But a super cool clip, as I said, of some of Africa's most iconic predators. Not every day you see them standing face to face like that. And of course, just crossed over now to Willy Funtz River, one of our crocodiles in question. And Cindy Drake asks, when do wildebeest have their babies? Well, Cindy, it's a good question. We're not too far away now. Most of the time, the mating season for them, or rutting, not rutting season, the mating season is really around March to June, roughly. And then we tend to see majority of the calves dropped from around mid-November to the end of December. So for many of our antelope species, the ungulates, we'll start seeing a lot of the youngsters arriving around November. Many of the impala babies will arrive that time of year as well. And that tends to be the most common 
sightings. Well, what time of year for us to catch a lot of the young babies? And I think that'll be a good question for you all for today. How much do you think a baby wildebeest weighs when it's born? How much do you think a baby blue wildebeest weighs when it's born? Now, bearing in mind that an adult male wildebeest can be up to around 200 kilograms, 250 even, and a female around 200 to 215. So, let me know what you think. How much do you think a blue wildebeest weighs when it's born? Of course, we've gone back over to Tao now. And Leisha Coombs asks, do crocodiles like alligators bring their prey under the water and do the death roll with them? Yes, Leisha, they do. Absolutely. That role is one of the ways that they will try and subdue their prey, obviously utilizing the water systems that they spend majority of their life in to essentially drown their prey. And uh, most of their prey will succumb to drowning. And uh, once they do, the crocodiles can then Simply feel, feed at their leisure, really. Which is uh, obviously a nice thing for them. It's often a kill like that, especially a bigger animal like a wildebeest can last them quite a long time. A big kill like that sometimes can last a crocodile even a few months without having to feed again if they eat the majority of that hippo, sorry, that hippo of that wildebeest. And then sometimes you'll see that death roll after the carcass of the animal has actually been submerged in water for a while. And as the meat starts to decay, it's a way that the crocodiles will use to actually tear pieces of meat off. They'll hold on and then spin around to get pieces of meat off of the carcass. So it's pretty gruesome, but crocodiles got to eat. We've got a few answers coming in for our baby wildebeest question, so keep them coming in. We'll get to that a little later. How much do you think a baby wildebeest weighs when it's born? I think now let's have a look at another one of our highlight clips. And this one was really fun to watch. And someone who's been hanging around on the cameras for a while now. We had it over the weekend in any case and so, something we don't see very often on the cameras. Now it's a bird that is fairly common or commonly seen in many other parts of Africa, particularly around Central Africa. Not as commonly seen down here. Sort of a more patchy distribution. And this is of course the beautiful Pell's fishing owl, as the name suggests, it is indeed a fishing owl, and you'll sometimes see it wading through the water like this, looking for prey, from fish to various amphibians or frogs, even freshwater mussels. He just saw it flying off having a go, almost catching something, just missed it. They'll look out for the little ripples at the surface of the water for the fish 
disturbing the water and as soon as they see those ripples that's what they'll utilize to try and get to those uh, fish prey species and then they'll grab them and then they fly off back to the perch where they're hunting from and then feed on that fish up in the tree. That's generally how it will work for them. And they are formidable hunters, but something really special to see. There are many, but there I know, who uh, have spent many, many, many months looking for pals fishing out. And this is another good time for them fishing owls and fish eagles, various aquatic waders. Again, something we spoke about, where we've had, well, it's a really good time of year for all of those piscivorous birds. As the water dries up, of course, there's just less place for the fish to hide. So it's a nice time for them to be hunting and pearls fishing owl is no different. And it's likely close to the Pell's Fishing Owl breeding season. They tend to breed in the dry season. And like so many big raptors, they are monogamous. And normally just utilize a natural hollow or cavity in the trees. And similar to most owls, they actually don't really use any nesting material in the trees itself. And something's disturbed these kudu. You can see that white tuft of the tail as they're trotting away. They don't look too perturbed. No alarm calls going off, so I suspect they were just disturbed perhaps by an elephant or another individual at the waterhole. Let's head on over to Tembi. Haven't been over there yet today. Have a look at what we got hanging around at Tembi. Again, we've had some pretty good luck with the elephants there. We'll have a look around here and see what we can find. Well, there you go. A couple of elephants arriving on cue. Thank you, elephants. We do love it when you respond to our email requests for your arrival time. We've got a few good guesses coming in for our baby wildebeest wait. Keep them coming. A couple of you got it right. Kathy in Colorado asked, do the crocodiles go after the hippos in the river? Kathy, very seldom. Uh, the hippos are formidable uh, enemies to crocodiles. If they do have very young uh, calves with them, they generally will either keep those calves well away from the crocs, but even then, if the crocodiles do approach those little pods of hippos, the uh, mothers and even the dominant male will defend those calves vehemently. And... Uh, yeah, a crocodile is no match for a hippo when it comes to taking on each other one-on-one. -on -one. So for the most part, they will stay away from the hippos. And Rebecca asks, you can see the ribs on almost all of the wildebeest. Do they seem undernourished to you? Rebecca, it's a good point that you make. Um, the way that wildebeest look, though, can be a little bit deceiving. Another name for blue wildebeest is, in fact, a brindled gnu. And that brindled name actually comes from what looks like the stripes or ribs on the side of their body. So they look like little brown streaks. And 
they're basically just a number of vertical darker stripes. They go from about the neck to just behind the rib cage, and as I say, that's often referred to as brindled, and it can look or exaggerate them being a little skinny or undernourished, but yeah, this time of year, things are a bit tricky for them. So they probably will have lost some condition, but uh, often those little vertical tufts of hair can uh, be misleading and suggest that they're much skinnier than they actually are. But a great question. Thanks for that. And I think let's dive into our next little highlight video while we watch these lovely Ellie Bulls. Got a, another great one lined up for you. Something we don't see every day. But absolutely one of my favorite species to spot on the cameras. These are of course African wild dogs. Or painted wolf. Many of us have decided we're now going to call them painted wolf. Simply to get the process moving and have the name changed. Because it sounds way cooler. <laughs> so maybe you can all help us with that. You can see them here just happily playing around in the water and uh, perhaps on the lookout for a, a hunt. As you can see they don't like walking slowly through the water. They know the danger or potential danger of crocodile. One of the most awesome things to watch about wild dogs is just how much they will play with, you, with each other. Always reinforcing those social bonds within the pack which of course is so important for them and hunting. One of Africa's most prolific hunters. Using a very similar technique to wolves where they will, as a pack, run down their prey and almost wear them down through sheer endurance. Taking turns to be in the lead as they chase down those prey species but uh, one thing about wild dog sightings is that they're almost always fleeting just like that they disappear but some of my best game viewing out on the wild has been watching wild dogs on the hunt just trying to keep up with them in the Land Rover can be pretty tricky but uh, Almost always great fun. And thank you for all your answers to our little quiz question today. Keep them coming. Some of you have got some good answers. Kathy Barton, you're pretty close. Tammy Boatman, also pretty close. Kathy in Colorado, not bad. Cindy Drake, nope, it's a little bit high at 80 kilograms. But keep them coming, we'll get there shortly. And just a question from Laura MC. Are either of the elephants on Tembi considered big tuskers? Uh, Laura, I wouldn't consider any either of these two big tuskers. Certainly that chap on the left has got a lovely pair of tusks. Defining a tusker is always a little bit tricky in the first place. For the most part, you'd expect a tusker, a real tusker, to have tusks that reach almost a at least another I would say three or four feet towards the ground the tusks themselves but there are some wonderful tuskers that we get at the waterhole from time to time uh, Tembi being one of the areas in Africa known for that so keep your eyes peeled this chap may still grow those tusks for a few more years So you never know. 
but for the time being, yeah, just a nice set of tusks, but I certainly wouldn't classify him as a big tusker just yet. And uh, we have a question, are Gnu and Wildebeest the same? They are indeed the same. Simply a different name in terms of location. Down in South Africa, often referred to as wildebeests, but in other parts of Africa, Gnu, but it really doesn't matter either way. Let's have a look at another one of our highlight clips before we head out today. And this one, another awesome, awesome clip from the nomad camp of our young hyena cubs. And it looks like we've got some action where, of course, these cubs have actually been moved. This was the previous den. They've moved, been moved by mommy to another den site, which is pretty common. I'll move around to often three, four, five different den sites, depending on the number of other potential threats to the cubs themselves. Things like course lions or too much leopard activity even wild dogs but such a pleasure to see these little youngsters out of the den I was having a look at them earlier they look like they're about a month old so still very young as they get a little older in the next month or so we should start seeing them losing that dark chocolate brown color and getting those little spots uh, little spots coming through like mommy and unlike so many of the big predators you know hyenas hyena cubs are actually born with their eyes open and even with little teeth coming through so in many ways ready to go and even though they start will start eating meat at a very young age they'll often suckle on mom for even a year 18 months which is pretty unusual for big mammals normally once they are weaned they don't tend to go back too much to the mother's milk Perhaps it has something to do with the very high nutrition level in the milk, so they enjoy that. But uh, you can just see here how gentle mom is, often considered one of Africa's bad guys. But hyenas really are incredible moms, with the clan really all working together to protect and help raise those youngsters. Uh, hopefully soon we'll have relocated those uh, those hyenas in their new den and we can keep an eye on these two youngsters see how they do as they go forward in life pretty tough life for all the animals in Africa of course to make it to adulthood so hopefully these two little youngsters we wish them all the best and we'll keep an eye on them see how they do but even a baby hyena can be cute look how cute that little guy is and there you go off to a new home all right so I think it's time to answer your questions many of you did indeed get it right We've got uh, Jolie Evans. You got it right. Uh, Geert, you're a little bit high. Jolie, that was very specific, so I, I hope you didn't cheat. But uh, to put you all out of your misery, Abe, Wildebeest calf is around about 22 kilograms when it's born. Very well developed. As I said, about 10% of its 
mother's body weight when it's born. A fairly long gestation period, around 250 days. And incredibly, as many of you will know, that calf is actually able to run with mom within even a few minutes after being born. So they really are incredible animals. Hopefully in the next month or two, we'll start seeing some of those little calves arriving. But uh, unfortunately, folks, that's all we have time for today. It's always a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you so much for your questions and for taking part in our little quiz. Please do join us again, same time, same place, for the show which is always live and interactive. And uh, please do like and subscribe and share your experiences with your friends. Let them know so they can come and join us and enjoy the fun on these incredible cameras around South Africa. As always, it's been my pleasure chatting with you all. My name's Russell Gerber. You can follow me on at Russ the Ranger, if you're keen on checking out some of the things I've been up to. But in the meantime, keep your eyes on the cameras. And stay with us. We'll be back with you all next week, same time, same place. Cheers for now.